Hey everyone, this is Chris Davis, your video producer, and here is my list of my top five most wanted games of announcement season 2021. Okay, so before we start, I just want to clarify what this list is about. These are games that I want to see announced at E3 or during this summer when everyone decides to do either a direct or a press conference. And as of Friday, June 4th, when this is being recorded, they're unrevealed or may not even exist. This is a pie in the sky, wish upon a star kind of list. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. So here's my number five. It's easy to forget that Bioware was once a much bigger studio system than it is today. Thanks to Papa EA being money hungry and bloodthirsty over the past generation, the number of studios under their umbrella has dwindled significantly. However, one studio has yet to be taken out back by the woodshed. Bioware Austin, developers of 2011's Star Wars The Old Republic. Now, in the four years that followed the release of the game, the Texas-based studio strongly supported the project, riding high on EA's exclusivity of the Star Wars license. At the same time, however, the team was working on a side project, a new IP envisioned as an episodic RPG called Shadow Realms. The project was eventually canceled, however, thanks to other EA projects that were backfiring at the time, as well as Bioware Edmonton's need for assistance on Dragon Age 3 and Mass Effect Andromeda. The last major expansion for the Old Republic came out in 2019, and since then there's been no hints as to what's next for the game. But between Shadow Realms cancellation and completion of Andromeda and Inquisition, not to mention the whole debacle that is Anthem, it's clear that the rest of that studio has been working on something. What that is, I have no idea, but given the timeline, it's about time to find out. So what could that be then? Well, though it's only a rumor at this point, I feel like it's pretty reasonable to suggest that Bioware Austin is the prime team to finally conclude the story of Knights of the Old Republic that has been left incomplete since 2004. The foundation upon which their MMO was built has long been awaited by fans, and that fervor seemed brought back to life after EA announced their first Battlefront game back in 2013. Everything they would have needed to get started is already there. Over a decade of art assets, character models, world designs, and more in combination with a strong background in RPG storytelling and, and talented developers makes me think that they are more than up to the task of finishing the saga. While I haven't played The Old Republic myself, I've done my reading, and there appears to be sufficient enough length of time and material to work with that could link the Sith Lords and The Old Republic together with a game in the middle. And that's why I think this could be. That'd be pretty cool. This is of course pure speculation. For all we know, we'll only hear about a new Old Republic expansion this year, given that Papa EA still seems hell-bent on sending good studios to die if they fuck up. And Anthem was a fairly prominent fuck up. I really hope they haven't been relegated to Dragon Age 4 and Mass Effect 4 support because that'd be just a waste of goddamn talent. Bioshock was one of the most exciting new franchises to come out of the seventh generation of consoles. Beneath the Atlantic Ocean and high in the sky, the stories that follow the two impossible societies and the incredible connection between them enraptured audiences and brought Take-Two Interactive untold gobs of money. The epilogue content Burial at Sea brought an end to Elizabeth and Booker's journeys and potentially the entire franchise as a whole. Except, well... Take-Two wants more money, and we want more Bioshock. So for years we've heard rumors and suggestions about where the franchise would go. Here's what we know for certain. First, Bioshock 4 is indeed in development. Though not with either 2K Marin, which is now defunct, nor the Rational Games, which, well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Instead, it's in the hands of Cloud Chamber, a new pair of studios in California and Quebec that were established in late 2019. The staffing there is looking to be pretty promising in the moment. 
Bioshock 1's design director Jonathan Pelling is there, as well as the original game's art director Scott Sinclair. We also know that Cloud Chamber has been hiring for a while now, looking for personnel with backgrounds in first-person gameplay, open-world design, role-playing games, and Unreal Engine experience. But with it being less than two years since the formal announcement of a studio forming, let alone COVID throwing a wrench in the works of absolutely everyone, is it feasible that we could see a proper demonstration of the game this summer? No, certainly not. However, a formal project announcement or teaser trailer is something I want to believe that's possible. Now, diving into the realm of speculation, there's been a sea of unconfirmed pieces of news and rumors over the years about the next step for the Bioshock franchise. We know that 2K Marin's Bioshock 2 was a trimmed down final result of the original vision of the game, and Bioshock Infinite scope and scale was widely cut back following an incredibly promising E3 2011 demo. Between the three games in the franchise, there is a ton that was left on the cutting room floor that could be explored. One of the more recent rumors has been that the project would be in a new setting. Though I would honestly be hesitant to embrace that idea as the franchise is so tied into the cities of Rapture and Columbia that I feel like it would be detrimental to not have a direct physical connection there. That being said, as long as they stick to the Infinite's reveal of the Man City Lighthouse Constants and Variables theme, I'll be happy. What I think would be more interesting, though, would be the time in which the news story takes place. All of these have been period pieces, set in 1912 and then later in the 1960s, far removed from the rest of civilization. I've always been enticed by the idea of Andrew Ryan's fear of Rapture's discoveries and scientific innovations being captured and exploited by the superpowers of the Cold War. And I think there... Telling the story of Rapture after Bridget Tenenbaum left at the end of Minerva's Den would make for a good story. What would a Rapture in the 1980s, overrun with splicers long suffering from atom withdrawal, be like? Especially if the United States or the Soviet Union decide to come a-knocking. It's fan speculation. Sure, I get that. That's me. But if we had to continue to embrace Rapture as a setting, then that's the kind of story I think I'd want to see told. Again, we're in the shallows on clear information about what this next Basha game would be. But maybe, just maybe, we'll get an inkling of what to expect this year. If there was one universal adjective used to describe how people felt when they heard that Microsoft put down $7.5 billion to buy Bethesda Softworks, it would be shock. We all knew that the Xbox brand was hungry for exclusives and new talent, Because, after all, you can't just keep making only Gears of War games and outsourcing Halo to third-party developers. But that's a chunk of change no one could have been expecting a video game division to be willing to spend. Come Sunday the 13th, we're promised an exciting show, and the potential lineup is one you can't ignore. Between Starfield, Halo Infinite, Hellblade 2, Fable, Avowed, and more, there's a lot to be excited about. But there's one little studio on the lineup in particular that I have my eye on. Roundhouse Studios. As one of the eight studios that Microsoft gobbled up in their Bethesda acquisition, Roundhouse is easily the most unknown quantity in the lineup. It's when you look at the studio's makeup, though, that you realize there's something very interesting there. And yes, I'm playing this old footage of the Prey 2 demo for a good goddamn reason. Because the people that made this canceled project are the very ones that are at Roundhouse. The story goes that after Prey 2 was canned by Bethesda, Human Head Studios had a really rough patch going. The multiplayer title they picked up from TimeGate Studios' bankruptcy in 2013, called Minimum, was pulled from Steam Early Access the following year. In 2018, we saw the poorly received live-action slash CG brawler hybrid title that was The Quiet Man. And that game was a meme on its own. On November the 12th, 2019, their sequel to the one IP they really owned, Rune, came out of the gate to mediocre reviews and even weaker sales. The very next day, Human Head was forced to close its doors. But something curious happened that day, though. They were rescued. In an announcement that same morning, Bethesda revealed that they were forming a new studio and had invited the entire staff of Human Head to join it. And, from what I've been able to gather, it appears that the vast majority, if not everyone that was working at Human Head on Tuesday, were working for Roundhouse the following Wednesday. 
it's like you're told to clear out your desk at 5 p.m. one day, and the next they're telling you to bring your stuff back to your spot at 9 a.m. So for all intents and purposes, Human Head Studios is alive and well, just rebranded and working on an unannounced project. But what could that project be? Well, I don't know. I can only speculate. It would be hard to believe, though, that as soon as the ink was dry on that paperwork, that the Roundhouse leadership would not ask to bring back Prey 2 under a different name. After all, Bethesda owned the IP, Roundhouse had all those old assets from four years previous, and in that span of time, lessons and reevaluation could have occurred that would make a refreshed title a viable thing to see through to completion. Am I saying that Roundhouse's first official project under both Bethesda and Microsoft's banners is Prey 2 and everything but name? No, of course not. I've got zero proof to work with. Am I hoping and wishing that's the case? Fuck yeah, I am. Whatever Roundhouse is actually working on, I'm willing to bet something to be excited for. Despite their tumultuous last decade, Human Head was a talented development studio that had plenty of potential and now, under stronger guidance and direction, they could really flourish. Hey, it worked for id Software. There's no reason it can't happen again. This next one is purely wishful thinking. I have no evidence to support the potential existence of it whatsoever, but in my heart of hearts, I am absolutely begging for a new Splinter Cell game. As I've espoused for a long, long time now, Splinter Cell is very close to my heart and I will never, ever turn down an offer to play or talk about it. To me, it's on the level of Brad's passion for Final Fantasy Tactics, Nolan's love for The Last of Us, Nick's infatuation for Days Gone. No series has ever engaged me in both single player and multiplayer at the same time like this before. And I want it back. No, I need it back. It's not as if Ubisoft has been able to go more than a month since 2013 without fans demanding the next entry in the franchise. We're a passionate people, and Ubisoft's focus on more monetizable properties like open worlds and games as a service titles have made the eight years since Blacklist came out an increasingly agonizing wait. They've attempted to placate us with cameos and DLC for other series like Ghost Recon and Rainbow Six. This past September, they announced an Oculus VR game lineup that includes a Splinter Cell title. But no, those are not what we want. Not nearly so. It's time, Ubisoft. Splinter Cell was originally designed as a technology demonstrator, a game that wowed audiences with its lighting techniques and complex shadow rendering back when that technology was still widely out of reach for the rest of the industry. We now live in an age of ray tracing, where lighting need no longer be baked in and prioritized in level design. You should step up and show the world that you can create exciting, fun worlds to explore but also use new technologies that will make rival developers, publishers just, just stop and wonder just how the fuck you did it. Prove that you have not abandoned the offline experience and that you are not beholden to a games as a service model. This series made you hundreds of millions of dollars, Ubisoft. Let it live again. Also, bring back Michael Ironside. You paid him to voice about two paragraphs into a microphone in the Wildlands DLC in 2018, and then did a behind-the-scenes promo piece decreeing that he was Sam Fisher's actor in response to the negative feedback to Eric Johnson's just okay performance in Blacklist. You clearly have the money to get Ironside back behind a microphone, and the willingness to go back to the original method development before the advent of digital actors, so why not just embrace it? Also. Please, for the love of God, hurry up. Michael Ironside is 71 now. Let's not take the risk of waiting too much longer and fucking things up. We just had a goddamn global pandemic after all. Ubisoft, I know you like your surprises during E3 every year, but in recent years, you've seen pretty much success. The gaming community largely believes that Beyond Good Evil 2 is more myth than reality now, and Skull and Bones is so stuck at deep in development hell that it sounds like it'll be another console generation before it comes out. How do I even talk about Wild? Where the hell is that? Can you just say that's fucking cancelled? But you know what would get people's attention? A series that is beloved by fans. A brand umbrella that makes you and your investors a ton of money. A game that would 
be all but unchallenged in the stealth gameplay genre now that Konami has long since swallowed the crazy pills and abandoned proper game development. That title is Splinter Cell 7. Do it, guys. Make your big surprise of E3 21 Splinter Cell. I'm begging you here. March of 2021 marked the 7th anniversary of the release of Bioshock Infinite, arguably the most controversial entry of the series and the last time we got to experience a Bioshock game. Shortly before the completion of the second episode of the epilogue expansion Burial at Sea in 2014, it was announced that Irrational would be undergoing restructuring, resulting in the vast majority of the staff there being laid off and, for all intents and purposes, completely gutting the studio. In the years that have followed, we've only heard sporadic pieces of information come out of the rebranded Ghost Story games, so it's hard to tell what we can expect out of them at the moment. That is, except for one particular, potentially very exciting prospect. At the annual Game Developers Conference in 2014, studio head Ken Levine held a talk for his vision of a next-generation narrative system. He called it Narrative Legos. The idea he presented was to create an infinitely replayable single-player RPG with systemic, randomized relationships, personalities, and motivations within the characters and factions of a world. While the basic overall goal of the game would be the same, the road along the way could be completely different between each player's run of the story. It would be like a seed in a procedurally generated game like Minecraft or FTL, but that seed would not affect level structure or item placement, but rather the perspectives, interests, and goals of the NPCs that populate the world. Repressed populations could change position in society. Love stories could be between different characters. Conflicts could be born between different nations. The idea dismisses the principle of set roles and rules in narrative creation and narrow story exploration. And it's goddamn fascinating to think about. The major struggle Levine foresaw with this idea was the writing. Storytelling like this can't be particularly generated yet, or at least confidently, so it would come down to a lot of writing, potentially the most you've ever seen put into a single-player title. This content would have to be written modularly, with a focus on de-emphasizing pronouns and adjectives and have an unfathomable amount of proofreading done to ensure that the correct characters had valid and believable relationships and experiences between one another. It would be a monumental undertaking requiring years of work. But here's the thing. It's been years. Seven years now since a rational now ghost story announced a new title, let alone released one. Now, to be clear, Levine said in his GDC talk that this was not a design or a pitch for a product and that to say otherwise would have been a lie. However, this is something he'd been thinking about for a while, and I can't think of anyone, any investor, any publisher or otherwise, who would not want to throw money at this. The creative lead of the Bioshock franchise is coming up with an incredibly innovative idea with grand implications for how games are written in the future. Why would you not want to be in on the ground floor of that? With the release of the next generation consoles and possibly sufficient time committed to such a narrative Lego project, I think it's well within reason that we could see Ken Levine's next project be announced this year. And that's exceptionally exciting. Is his next project this very thing? Perhaps. It's been rumored for a while now that Ghost Story's project is a sci-fi RPG and could be late into production at this point. But who knows? Take-Two is expecting to have a showcase on Monday the 14th, so here's hoping. Alright guys, I hope you liked the list. Thanks for watching. Uh, I know it's been a number of years since we've had a proper top five go up, but now that I've revamped the assets, I'm hoping that we can get more of these going. Uh, as always, we really appreciate your feedback and support, and I hope that you keep coming back for more. That's it. Have a nice day.